Welcome back to our series on tensor calculus. Back in video 28, we derived an expression for the covariant derivative as it relates to contravariant vector components. Here in video 32, we're going to do something similar to derive the expression for the covariant derivative as it relates to covariant vector components. Today we're going to do the same thing we did back in video 28. Only this time we're going to represent our vector t using a contravariant basis. And that of course means we're going to need a covariant component combined with a contravariant basis vector just like this. Okay, now let's take the partial derivative of both sides with respect to z, j. So we'll start over here with uh, our vector taken with respect to z, j. Now on the right-hand side, of course, we have to use the product rule. So we'll take the partial of our component, ti, with respect to z, j. And we'll hold the basis vector fixed. Then we'll add a term with the component times the partial derivative of our basis vector, the partial of zi with respect to zj. Okay, so now we have this expression that uh, looks a lot like what we ran into before, only this time the index is here in the upper position. Last time it was down here, if you remember. So let's go see what this... Uh, means. Okay, so we've got the partial derivative of zi with an upper index this time with respect to zj. Well, just like before, any vector that uh, we use, we take the partial derivative of any vector, we'll get a vector so we can decompose this into a linear combination. But of course we have two free indexes here, so what we're really doing is decomposing nine different expressions as a linear uh, combination. So we'll use the uh, letter pi to represent our linear factor here. And to start off with, I've got to have index i and j here as live indexes to match what I've got on the left-hand side. Then I'm going to form a contraction with our contravariant basis vector this time that looks like this. So just like before, we've got nine expressions, one term on the left, but three terms on the right, because I'm decomposing each of these nine vectors into linear combinations on the right-hand side. Okay, now I'll take the dot product of both sides of this with respect to covariate basis, Zm. So we'll have Zm, that's our covariate basis vector, we'll dot that with the partial derivative of zi with respect to zj. And of course, I have to do the same thing on the right-hand side. So we'll have pi i j k times z k. And then I'll need to take this and dot it with z m. Okay, now these two uh, vectors that I've dotted together will just give us a Kronecker delta term. So it's going to be pi i j k, and we're going to have a delta k m like that. Now the k index is absorbed here, leaving us just with pi i j m. Now I can... Uh, Switch sides of the equation as I did before. I'll switch this to the left, uh, this to the left side, this to the right side. And in the process, I'm also going to rename the m index back to k. So let's do that. We'll have pi i j k is equal to z k. I've renamed m back to k now. So this is zk dotted with the partial derivative of zi with respect to zj, like so. Now, so far, everything we've done here is completely analogous to what we did in video 28. Of course, we were working with um, the Christoffel symbol over here. 
and this index was in the upper position and this index was in the lower position so very similar to what we did in video 28 it's just that the indexes are kind of in a different place here okay but now I want to take a slightly different tact I want to look at um, this expression Z K dotted with the contravariant basis vector zi well you know that that's just delta ik but now let's take uh, the partial derivative of both sides of this with respect to zj so to do that on the left i of course have to use the product rule i'll take the partial derivative of the first term here it's the partial of z k with respect to zj and I'll dot that with the other term zi and this should be a vector up here and then the second term is going to be our, our first factor zk and we will take the partial derivative of the second factor which is the partial of zi with respect to zj and on the right hand side what's the partial derivative of uh, Kronecker delta well the delta is just a constant so the right hand side of this is equal to zero all right so what does that mean well first of all look at this expression and compare it with this it's obviously the same thing so in this particular term we'll just have pi ijk now the first term what is that well if you just flip the order of these terms where you have zi dotted with this uh, partial derivative there if you go back a couple of videos you'll remember that's the express form for our Christoffel symbol using indexes i k and j and all of that is equal to zero okay so what we see here is that there's uh, the 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 pi factor that we've introduced is not an independent factor it is in fact directly related to our Christoffel symbol in fact in a very simple fashion we can say that that uh, I'll do it up here pi ij then ijk is really equal to negative gamma i k j and of course we could flip-flop these lower indexes on our Christoffel symbol and that means that it's equal to negative gamma i j k like that so all of that having been said we don't need to to introduce we don't really need to use this new factor of of pi ijk what we'll do is just to form our linear combination up here using our negative gamma term here so this is going to be equal to negative gamma i j k times z k like so and i hope you follow through with this our we we went through the same analysis as in video 28 to discover we needed some sort of a linear factor to form a linear combination but when we got through with it we realized that this new factor we're introduced here is nothing but the negative of our christoffel symbol like so therefore what i want to do is to substitute this expression for this one back in our original line of investigation so let's go do that okay so what I'm doing here uh, we'll write the partial derivative of our tensor T with respect to ZJ and this first term doesn't change at all it's the partial of TI with respect to ZJ times ZI plus ti now what we're going to have is the factor that is the negative Christoffel symbol ijk that we just analyzed 
times the uh, Z K figure like this. Okay, this is just the expression that we derived uh, in the previous analysis. And we substituted that for this expression right up here. Okay, now next thing I want to do, if you remember how we did it in video 28, we want to do some renaming of the indexes in the second term so that we get both terms with the same factor of zi as the, um, the basis vector. So to do that, we'll just copy the first term as is, the partial derivative of ti with respect to zj times zi. Nothing changes there. Now I'm going to reorder the terms a little bit. I'll have gamma and then t and then z. And that'll be our basis vector out here. Okay, so what I need is to have zi, not zk. So if that's the case, I need to rename k to i. So this will be an i now. And this will be an i right here. And if I'm going to rename k to i, I've got to rename i to something else. So I'll rename i back to k, like so. And k will go here. And that leaves index j, which we'll leave alone right there. OK, so now the expression looks like this. Partial of our vector t with respect to zj is going to be equal to the partial of our component ti with respect to zj minus this time gamma k ji times tk. And now because both terms contain the zi factor, I can factor it outside like this. And what I finally have is a linear combination for their partial derivative. So now, because of the quotient theorem, we know we have a vector here, which is a tensor. We have a vector here, which is a tensor. And we know it's not equal to 0. So this expression has to be a tensor. And therefore, it is our expression for the covariant derivative with respect to j of a covariant vector component. That's going to be equal to the partial derivative of our component with respect to zj minus gamma k ji times tk, like so. This is the result we're looking for. In video 28, we found out how to find the uh, covariant derivative of a contravariant vector component and now we have the expression we need to find the covariant derivative of a covariant vector component. So let's go over and update our fact sheet. This is what we just derived as the uh, covariant derivative for a covariant vector component. Now, um, by the way, I guess uh, technically I should have added the word covariant vector component here. But it is uh, quite customary to refer to this as a covariant vector. You, of course, know that's not technically correct. It's a covariant vector component. A vector itself is neither covariant or contravariant. But it's such a mouthful to keep saying covariant vector component that it's quite customary just to refer to this as a covariant vector. All right, uh, before we talk about it, let me just put up the expression that we derived back in video 28. Uh, it's easier to talk about this if we have the two to contrast. So they're alike in many ways, a similar structure, almost a mirror image of each other. They're both covariant derivatives. In both cases, we take a partial derivative first. Then we add a term like this. That's a combination of our Christoffel symbol and the vector component itself. Uh, so in that way, these two are, are very similar. The difference is, of course, 
Well, here we have the index in the lower position. Here it's in the upper position because this one is covariant and this one is contravariant. Now the indexes for each of the other terms are also in the lower position, so everything's consistent throughout the expression. And down here, the index of our component is also in the upper position throughout. Now, because of where the free indexes are, this expression is going to be a second rank tensor that is twice covariant. This is going to be a second rank tensor that is once contravariant and once covariant. So this is going to be a covariant tensor, and this one is mixed because it has an index in the upper and the lower position. So for our, our covariant expression, we're also going to use a negative sign. For contravariant, we'll use a positive sign. And the other major difference is the, the structure of our contraction. Here, the contraction is formed from high to low, like this. And here, it's formed from low to high, like this. And that makes sense, because it has to be that way if our index is in the lower position and the upper position, respectively. Now, in a lot of literature, you'll see this second term represented with the lower components of ij. Well, of course, you know that's equal, because we can flip these two indexes. But I like to put j first so that it is consistent between the two expressions. j is first here. It's also the index we use when we're taking the covariant derivative. It is the extra index that is introduced to the expression because of the operation. Every time we take a partial derivative or a covariant derivative, we add a covariant index. That's the, the reason for the name. The operation itself is a covariant derivative because it adds a covariant index. And that's true whether we're dealing with a covariant vector or a contravariant vector. In either case, we're adding a covariant derivative. OK, uh, it's just easier for me as a memory aid to know that, the, that this index will always go first in our Christoffel symbol. Then we form the contraction based on whether the component has an upper or lower index. And then the remaining index, of course, goes in the remaining slot here. And of course, remembering that, that this one is lower than, uh, this is negative, and that one's positive, I remember that negative is lower than positive. It's kind of silly, but it's, it makes it easy to remember. OK, so we now have the ability to take the covariant derivative of either a covariant vector component or a contravariant vector component. Now, in the next video, I'm going to walk you through a direct proof that both of these expressions are indeed tensors.